Hi, it's Larry here of Xbox Live's Major Nelson. It has been a big week at Xbox. I'm here with Phil Spencer, who's the new head of Xbox. Phil, congratulations on the job. Thanks, Larry. You've got a lot of work coming up. Let's talk about your new role. What are you going to be doing? <laughs> uh, head of Xbox. Uh, my role is really to drive the product vision for what Xbox is. You know, I come at this job uh, as a, somebody from the games industry, built, running game studios. I think about our Xbox product and how we can really put the stamp of the gamer on this product, make sure it's gaming first. Obviously, it has great entertainment features for everybody, uh, but my role is to bring everybody together and make sure we're focused on a consistent product vision. Public number we've announced is eighteen. Just okay, I have, for some reason I thought. Oh, that. but it's really thirty. It's more. It's more than eighteen. All right, Peter, so big press briefing yesterday. Tell us a little bit about the, the excitement around uh, Xbox 360 in Japan. Well, I think, you know, the interesting thing, certainly the years that we've been, quite frankly, focusing on this market and, and struggling a little bit, um, as I think is, is well known, yesterday seemed, uh, it was cathartic for me and the team on the ground here because we're starting to now see validation of all of the efforts that we put into really addressing the issues in this market that we have, looking at the overall challenges of the content piece that I don't think up until this year we've done a fabulous job in, in addressing, and that is really specific content for the Japanese gamer. And the bets that we placed with people like Sakaguchi-san in particular, um, I think as evidenced by the reaction yesterday yeah. with both Lost Odyssey and Blue Dragon, uh, really seem to be on the brink of paying off. So. I feel good for the team on the ground here. Now, my reaction was, I went to, you know, when Sensui san and I had finished on stage, um, I kind of said to him, you know what? It, with the pricing of the of the core bundle for Blue Dragon being at 28,000 yen, with having Blue Dragon ready to go on the 7th of December, and as beautiful a game as that looks, with um, the innovation of the HD DVD player and that being brought to market here, and with the 100,000 units that Sony said is going to ship into the marketplace. Um, I feel like I said to I, I don't know what else we need to do at this point to be successful in this market. Yeah, I mean, the games the games that we showed yesterday were pretty extraordinary. Blue Dragon alone, there was about a 15 or 20 minute demo that, that the creator himself did. Yeah, exactly. And it, it looked phenomenal. What do you tell to someone who's sitting back in North America, say right now, and looks at that and goes, I don't, they don't understand it. Yeah. Well, you know, and in some instances it goes back to my original comment that, that we needed to focus on games that quite frankly maybe Western gamers don't understand yeah. but Japanese gamers love. Um, there is both in that game and most definitely in that game and a little bit in Lost Odyssey you saw what really is exciting to a Japanese gamer which is a strategic type of game when you saw the it's a turn-based RPG obviously so yeah. you saw what uh, 
uh, character heroes had to do against the boss characters. It's more than the, the, the usual real-time action-adventure stuff that we in the West love. There was yeah. the decision-making, the Sakaguchi. Actually, was struggling. I don't know if you know this. But, yeah. Because that's a tough boss character in that particular level. He, but it's a, he kept pounding away and uh, was, was making decisions that weren't quite optimal to, to get past that boss character. And that's the beauty of the game. Yeah. And I think he said out loud, be careful when you play this at TGS because you can die pretty easy. Yeah, he did. He said yeah. that. So, um, but I think that was proof positive to me that it's not necessarily something we should understand or, or say, that's the type of game I can't wait to play. Right. Uh, I think you could, you could see that, and certainly I talked to many members of the Japanese press last night. Uh, I did about three hours of interviews post the, um, the press conference, and they all said, Blue Dragon is exactly what you're going to need to do to be able to capture the hearts and minds of the Japanese gamers. Peter Moore was 100% right. In order to penetrate other markets you have to bring the games that those markets want in japan you need to be in games that that japanese gamers are going to resonate with in china same thing in america same thing the japanese are great at this the metal gear solids the the last of us uh resident evil those are all like americanized type games based on american cultures but then they also have games that resonate with their people, like Street Fighter. Even though it resonates, resonates in America, Street Fighter is very much a Japanese game. I mean, even Nintendo with Mario, Nintendo with Zelda. Those are games that resonate with Japanese, but are also aimed and can resonate and did resonate with American. Um, Nintendo has went after America in almost all of their games. Samus. She's a blonde-haired chick. Mario's an a Italian plumber going after a blonde-haired chick. Um, Zelda uh, uh, going after a princess, blonde-haired, blue-eyed chick. You know, and, and Japanese gamers can resonate because the style of the game is very much Japanese. But the aesthetic can also resonate with the Western world. And that's what Xbox is missing. Here is how Microsoft sells themselves to other regions, not realizing that you're not giving them anything that Japanese gamers want. You are promoting the things that American gamers like. And that's why it's such a failure in other regions. Konnichiwa, Minasan. Exu Baksu no Fildes. Hey, it's Phil Spencer from Team Xbox. Uh, we've got exciting news today. But obviously, it's extraordinary times on the planet right now. Uh, we're all working from home, myself included. So this is my home office. Uh, but this is an important one. So I wanted to make sure that even from home, I could partake in the announcement that we have. Uh, as many of you know, the gaming market in Japan, fans in Japan, gamers in Japan are incredibly important to me and to Team Xbox. Some of the most amazing experiences we've all played on games have come from Japan. Uh, and we work really hard to make Xbox a part of the experience for our customers in Japan. Uh, one of the things that I get asked often about from our fans in Japan and the press in Japan is when is Xbox Game Pass going to come? Well, we've been working really hard with our partners and with our own service and our engineers, and we're happy to announce that on April 14th, we will be launching Xbox Game Pass for both PC and console in Japan. This is an announcement that I know many of you have been waiting for, and I really appreciate your patience as we've been working through all the details to make this happen, and we are here. So Xbox Game Pass will be launching, and we're excited to be able to bring an amazing set of games that are included in Xbox Game Pass uh, to all of our great fans in Japan. You see, Phil Spencer feels like a celebrity. And he feels like his face sells Xbox, but that's not how it goes in Japan, in China, in other countries. People don't care in those regions about you or the white man. I mean, just being what it is. They really don't care about you. They also don't care about Game Pass because Game Pass doesn't have games that pertain to them, at least new ones. You went out and you got old games that were already available on the more popular platforms in Japan and you brought it to Game Pass, 
thinking that just because it's a deal out there, they're going to care. That is the mecca of gaming. You need to have exclusive Japanese games on your platform day and date to even have a region care about Game Pass or about even you. He's selling Game Pass to players who don't resonate with Game Pass. And because of that, Xbox is stagnant in Japan. And people can say, oh, it sold more. And Listen, it is stagnant in Japan because they don't have games for it in Japan. That's why it can be the only one available and then they can, people will buy it and then that's it. But this is just the reason why Peter Moore was a better boss. He understood that games were more important than a deal. He understood that you need to bring games from different regions. And those different region games are legendary games for Xbox in America. Blue Dragon, Lost Odyssey are legendary RPGs in America for Xbox. And if you would have continued to bring that on, you would have more Japanese players that would bring in more Japanese developers and that would bring you more Japanese exclusives to help your console grow. But instead, you threw out the plan to get exclusives from Japanese developers to resonate with Japanese gamers and only chose to sell yourself and Game Pass and backwards compatibility. You see him here doing the same exact thing in China when they were first getting Xboxes and Playstations in China. They didn't have games that resonated with China. They had games that were just backwards compatible and had him out there explaining that to him instead of actual games that the gamers out there actually want. Technically, you own the rights to a title ID on the 360. That is your, um, that's, that, that's the product you own. Mm. So when, if it's a digital game, so you own the, the digital version of the game, mm. uh, you will see that game in your games library with the region of the game that you own from 360. If you own the physical disc of the game, when you put the disc in your Xbox One, we will find the digital version and we will bring the emulated digital version down, copy it down for that same title ID and you will be able to run that on your uh, Chinese console. Imagine being a Chinese gamer and seeing some guy come up with an Xbox shirt who seems vaguely familiar and he's talking in English about an Xbox but he's not talking about games you're going to play he's talking about how they work and this is how you introduce Xbox to Chinese gamers like that but again, he's so used to America and people kissing the ground he walks on. And he's this big celebrity out here. He needs to realize that out there, he's a nobody. And they only gonna care about the games that you have to present. And because you don't have games to present, you can, that can you know fly in America. It won't fly in Japan, it won't fly in China. It hasn't flown out there at all. And to give you further proof on how it actually looks, right? Remember what Peter Moore said about going after the Japanese gamer and bringing out games for Japanese players. Here's a rare video of an actual Japanese Xbox fan showing you what it's like to live the life of an Xbox fan in Japan. I wasn't sure if I should make this video because I don't think I can do justice with the lack of research and the lack of things I know about this but <clears throat> I want to talk about the uh, does that Xbox not being popular in Japan and not making sales in Japan the reason why I'm making this video is because I really love um, Xbox and the fact that it's not selling in this in my country it's really sad for me to be honest and I really it really got to me because a lot of people tend to go with uh, PlayStation and Nintendo and I don't blame them especially in Japan because you know both PlayStation and Nintendo are Japanese based um, 
companies that they make their consoles. So PlayStation 4, I guess PlayStation 4 Pro is the latest one and Nintendo with their Switch. And I don't blame the people who tend to go that way. And I'm not just talking about the Xbox X uh, because actually the Xbox One wasn't a big hit as well. So uh, I got like maybe two or three opinions I guess so number one opinion um, again we are in Japan so PS4 Nintendo is probably going to be more popular than an American based console and again I don't blame Japanese to not be um, you know interested in Microsoft you know they got their own console you know so yeah um, I guess that's my first opinion you know Japanese have their own console and American have their own console and obviously it's not gonna be you know we're in Japan so they're probably gonna go on that side so another thing that I think Xbox is lacking in Japan uh, is marketing like I've never I, I don't really see any Xbox ads or Xbox commercials I guess that's the same Xbox um, billboards then again Japan don't really have any that much billboards um, like even I guess in the electronic stores um, they're not that big of a deal like they don't really have that much they don't they have like small space for Xbox it's not that big it's not that fancy it's just a small thing so marketing in Japan not that good games as well there's not much games here um, there's not much Japanese game I guess for the Japanese gamers there's not much Japanese games that are in Xbox I don't believe so I never I, I don't play Japanese games like the anime games I don't play them but I've never seen them actually so I guess yeah the lacking of that as well I believe okay so I am here at the uh, one of the biggest electric electronic store in Japan and I'm here to see where the Xbox corner is and to be honest I can't even see it it's kind of weird I came here the other day and there was I mean we got this um, Xbox thing going down down this side uh, they're still selling the Xbox S uh, no Xbox X but I did not see I did not see the the section I mean there's a big ass section for the switch for the uh, Mario thing but there's no Xbox. Okay, wow. Okay, look at this uh, blue area here. This is the PS Vita. So, all of that is the PS Vita. Um, PS4, PS4, uh, Call of Duty. Wow, I, should, I'm, uh, I wanna buy this. But this is for the PS4. Okay, PS4, blue, blue. Um, switch is red, 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 and look at that. That small green thing, that's Xbox. I mean, look how lonely this guy is. And I guess this is it. And yeah, again, there's not much games here. Uh, it, marketing is bad. Even the uh, Xbox is right at the corner. Like this. This is where the game section starts and all of that is like tools and all that I don't really get. That is literally at the con corner of um, the game section and then it's right beside PS3 which makes no sense because the brand new PS PlayStation is right there which is PS4. So this is the point I'm making uh, about Xbox. It's not, it's not that popular, it's not that big of a deal in Japan. Japan should market this a bit more so people would realize that it's here i mean nobody's gonna know that xbox is here i bought my xbox like two years ago i i don't i don't think i said 
this before, but some of my friends actually thought um, that we couldn't get Xbox in Japan. It's that bad. The community, Xbox community, is that bad. There are little like co like groups, Xbox groups out there somewhere, but no, yeah, it's really bad. Like they don't even sell the Xbox X. This is the Xbox F 500 gigabytes and one terabyte. Yeah, I don't see the Xbox X anywhere. So I guess I'm going to end the vlog here. Vlog, I guess it's kind of like a small talk. I guess about Xbox in Japan. I came upon the article that really shocked me um, and I wanted to make a video about it. So I guess that's it. Uh, a lot of people look at me like that guy. I was actually surprised to see that. Um, I was planning to go to other stores and see their uh, Xbox setup, but after seeing that, it kind of crush my dreams basically just because of xbox i'm actually really set up what's going on in japan but yeah i uh, just um uh, i guess what i'm trying to say is uh to the japanese viewers um you know play more xbox try xbox if you're planning to get another console uh or it's your first console get xbox try xbox if you don't like it well xbox <laughs> I guess to Xbox, do more marketing in Japan, get more games of Japanese games in Japan, and then get more games in Japan, literally in Japan. Um, I guess, yeah, that's it. I didn't tell you guys, I actually have an Xbox S. I'm trying to get the Xbox 10, but I don't really have a 4K TV, so I don't really think that I will give it justice if I don't get a 4K TV because it doesn't make sense even the Xbox S plays 4K games which I don't have a 4K TV so it really it really there's no justice of playing it but it's still fun it's still fun but yeah uh, that's it for today's vlog I'm blabbing again every single end of the vlog I blab so I'm gonna stop the vlog here or video whatever it is I guess you got, I I hope you guys enjoyed it um, and I guess I'll see you guys in the next video. So yeah, that's my Xbox in Japan opinion kind of video. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. But am I even in the frame? I don't. Now you see him there yourself, right? He gives you video proof of how it looks in Japan. He tells you as a Japanese Xbox fan um, that they don't have advertising. They don't have games for Japanese gamers. They don't have anything to appeal to Japanese gamers when all these other consoles that are Japanese made, right? You already have the weakness of being an American made console. And they look at it. A lot of Japanese look at it like you have your console and Xbox. That's your American console. We have our Nintendo, our Sony consoles, which are Japanese. They are for us. And in order to penetrate that, you need to resonate with these people. And you haven't. You've literally cut them out. And he's telling you this. He's like, you need to advertise it more. You need to bring more games. You need to get commercials. You guys don't have commercials. People don't know you're even out here. People don't even know that you could buy an Xbox. And on top of that, they have the cheaper versions of Xbox. And uh, granted, this is back in Phil Spencer's era, right? Still Phil Spencer's era. But when the Xbox One X, this is about 2019, basically, when, they, when he did this video. And so literally three years later, obviously it didn't get any better and there is no new Japanese games for Japanese players and they didn't even have an Xbox One X even though it was already out all they had was the S so it's exactly the same thing right now to where they only have the S out there because it's cheaper and they're trying to sell them and they don't even have the Xbox Series X so watch as Sachi and Adila try to flip why they're failing or why they need this Activision deal to go through um, and compete in the Japanese market. It's just crazy. After seeing that video, look what Sachi and Adila has to say. How certain are you now compared to where you were that that's going to go through and, and how, how important is that to Microsoft? I, I, I saw that Bobby was on your network this morning and I thought he did a good job of explaining why he and I both are enthused about this combination because I think it will only bring more competitiveness uh, to the gaming industry. And look, I think 
I look at this and say, at the end of the day, the regulators around the world have to make the choices. Uh, and I would only submit to them that if they really seriously think about competition, they have to sort of really reflect on, is this going to be helpful to bring more competition? Right? Think about this. There are people who make more money in gaming who don't even build games today. Hmm. Uh, like Maybe we should look at that. Then even if you look at the console market, we should probably look at Microsoft's share of the console market in Japan as a, perhaps a question that somebody should ask and say, oh, wow, I wonder why that is. That's small. And maybe they should actually start competing more. Now, you see what he did there. He blamed their, their smallness in Japan on these, them not having Call of Duty. <laughs> You've seen him say he was ready to buy Call of Duty there for Xbox. He's the Xbox guy. That Japanese guy that we just watched, he said, ooh, Call of Duty, I'm going to buy that. Right? So why do you need it if it's already selling out there? No, the reason why your Xbox isn't selling out there is because you don't promote it out there. You don't have commercials out there. You don't have games that resonate with gamers out there. But you're using this to sell your console. And you notice, we haven't seen Phil Spencer too much in this deal. We've seen Phil Spencer a lot. And I do mean a lot in the Bethesda deal. And look what he had to say about the Bethesda deal when he was talking about that. Uh, I first want to ask about this. How will these ZeniMax assets help you with this latest Xbox launch, your Game Pass momentum, and xCloud? Yeah, I mean, gamers love great games. You just mentioned we've got the Xbox consoles going on pre-order tomorrow for the next generation. Just last week, we added Game Pass cloud streaming so people can play this Game Pass library across all of their phones, the Android phones out there. And then obviously Game Pass, which is the largest game content subscription out there, 15 million subscribers and growing. So getting to work with ZeniMax to bring their amazing collection of games to Game Pass is just an incredible opportunity for us. Now financially, when will this be accretive? Uh, are you making cuts to this company as you acquire it, or are you going to leave it alone? Uh, our plan is to leave it alone. I mean, ZeniMax has an amazing track record of building great games. Our goal is to make ZeniMax the best ZeniMax they can be, working individually with their studios on the great platform technology that we have, getting their creators' feedback into the things that we need to go build. That's just a critical flywheel for us innovating, is the feedback of the world's best creators on our platforms. Tell me about the gaming ecosystems Overall, Microsoft has spoken out against the way that Apple controls its app store on those lines. But how is that really different from the percentage that console makers take on games on their platforms? When you get large scale general platform, general compute platforms like mobile phones, people should have access to the great content and services that are out there. And we remain committed to that. There are over 3 billion people who play video games today. Many of them play on phones and we're committed to bringing Game Pass to all mobile phones out there, including Apple phones. We'll continue the conversations and I'm sure we'll be able to get to some resolution. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that gets to the core issue of how it's different though. Uh, what, what is the core issue? I mean, 30% uh, take, is it how they're trying to uh, command the way you you do uh, games in the cloud that also work through the App Store? Our biggest issue isn't a financial issue. Our biggest issue is that cloud game streaming apps are actually not allowed um, in the way that Game Pass is built for other platforms. So for us, this is about gamers having great access to the content from the creators they love on the devices they own. Play the games that you want with the community that you want to play on the devices that you have. That's our goal. So, Phil, on that note, then, uh, how will this affect the launch of future games? I know that ZeniMax was developing one for PS5 exclusively. Does that stay intact, or is that going to change after this deal? Yeah, the commitments we've already made with the gamers out there on the uh, games that people know about, we will continue with those commitments. The thing this is really about is a huge investment in our Xbox community. They know that the great games coming from ZeniMax and all of those studios, we're now at over 23 studios inside of uh, Xbox, those games will be able to come to the Xbox community, they'll come to Game Pass day and date, and people will have just an amazing collection of great games to continue to play on Xbox. Xbox Series X launch. I think pre-orders open tomorrow morning. You're not going to have Halo Infinite 
uh, for that. How has COVID affected game availability and how's that going to affect your marketing and, uh, and your expectations around the console launch? You know, people, you know, sheltering in place, work from home. We've seen incredible engagement in the great gaming community over the last few months. And we're really proud of the way that gaming has been able to play such a pivotal role for people. But you're absolutely right. Games today are hundreds of people coming together to build these massive games. And it's important that we're conscious of the safety of our teams. And it does have an impact on production. And you're seeing some of that out there. But when we look at this launch and people's appetite for gaming right now, we're very bullish on how our pre-orders are going to go tomorrow. We have the most powerful console in the market. We have the most affordable console in the market. We've got things like Xbox All Access that allow people to join this next generation of gaming for $24.99 a month. No upfront costs. You get a console and game pass. In times like this, I think that accessibility of price point and offer is really, really important. You see, Phil Spencer and Microsoft will change their tune on whatever they're talking about in accordance to what they want, not what the gamer wants, not what the competition is saying. They, they go in contrary of it. And Phil Spencer is more of a face of that, more of a person to deliver information, to sway the public into believing what they say at the moment they say it and then change it the next time you see him and you forget about the thing he said prior. Like, for example, here's here's Phil Spencer and his excuse for not having too many games at E3. And remember, this is the same guy who says this is going to be the best E3 ever. He did that for like seven years straight. But this is his excuse for not having games at an E3. Oh, it's so... I mean, you and I have actually been doing this for for a while. Like, I'm. This sounds like total PR line. Like, I I love my job. I love being a gamer. Uh, I've been a gamer since I was a young kid, playing games with my dad. Uh, and like, I I care about our platform, and I want to make it as good as I, I, I possibly can as, as the head of Xbox. When I started in this job three years ago, hardware was a real focus for us because I thought we were we had more work to do there. And S, we shipped last year. X is coming out this year. Right. I love our hardware line. Xbox Live was something I really wanted to focus on in terms of cross-platform, getting it on iOS, Android, Windows, focusing on our stuff, coming to Windows, because I really want people to play great games on the devices they want to go play. Our first party, my pre previous job was head of first party, is a critical part of that equation. Yesterday, sitting here today, showing our games, it was about 42 games filling up the time. But I know people want to see what we're investing in new. Uh, and we are investing in, in new things. We've signed things just recently that I didn't, I thought about, hey, from a PR standpoint, it'd be really easy for me to go put a trailer on screen, even though I know the game's not coming for two and a half, three right, years. Right. I didn't want to do that. And, and I understand certain people will say, well, hey, that'll give me, that gives me confidence in the future of Xbox. I, I'll just, this is kind of a cheesy line, but I'll say, trust that this is important to us right. as a platform. From the top CEO of the company on down, if you talk to Sati about it, he would say, I understand our, we need to invest in content in the gaming space. Uh, and that is important. And we are going to invest. Like, you see what he did there? Like, he, he goes and he says, oh, we didn't have, you know, new IPs to show you guys. But it's because we don't want to show you uh, a trailer of a game that's two and three years out. And then he contradicts that immediately, the next generation, when he showed you Fable, Hellblade, Avowed, um, Steady Decay 3. Um, even Forza um, Horizon, I mean Forza um, um, Motorsport, which is coming out three years after they showed the trailer. It's like the Xbox Series was that exact lie, was that exact thing that he said that he didn't want to do to, to gamers because he wanted you guys to trust. And then he turns around and does that very exact thing. He announced the Xbox Series X with Hellblade 2. And Hellblade 2 still doesn't even have a... a, a a, a, a holiday or, or a, anything close to being ready to be launched. And then he proceeds to talk about older games, claiming that they're good, and even claiming some third-party games or first-party games. And I love the games that we showed. Sea of Thieves, I thought Crackdown looked fantastic. I thought State of Decay looked really good. Super Lucky's Tales, a new first-party game. We got to re-announce Ori. The next Ori coming out, and Ori is one of my favorite games, frankly, of all Not time. Not many people played that game. That is I'm... a fantastic game. But I know what you're asking about. It's like, hey, 
there's kind of big triple A console the kind games. Of games that only the Microsofts, the Sonys, the Nintendo's right. of the world like can put the resources, like platform holders, uh, like only certain types of games those sorts of companies can make. Yeah, and I, I hear that and I'm committed to that. He hears that and is committed to that. He's committed to making first party games that are backed and funded by you know, a first party console holder that can can make games only a console holder can make. That's what the guy the guy means. What he means by that, for those who are slow, what he means by that is those are games that because because third party has to work on multiple versions of games or they got multiple different projects and yada 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 and they don't have the the right just money behind it on top of that because they're going through publishers he's saying where are those games that really push that needle and he's saying he's committed to that phil spencer and then turns around and does nothing but buy third party failing development teams that's it. That's that's his committed. That's that that's what he has proven he's committed at on. He's committed on bringing third party games, even though we're supposed to be talking about first party games. And what? Uh, let me give you an example because for the slow, right? Because this is always something that for the slow is a problem. Starfield was not funded by Microsoft. It was funded by Zenimax, Bethesda. It was a game already being made for years. Okay, four years. Um, Hi Fi Rush, same thing. Um, Psychonauts 2, same thing. Um, Bleeding Edge, same thing. These are games that came out recently for Microsoft. You know what I'm saying? The only two games they came out with that were in house was Forza Horizon 5 and Halo Infinite and Gears 5, right? Forza, Gears, and Halo. The same song and dance. And he's talking about he's committed to something. I mean, this, this that's his favorite word is committed. And people need to understand that this isn't really being committed. It's really just telling you what you want to hear. I mean, he's always been situational like that. He's always been the guy to say something that his fans want to hear to either go against the competition or to go with the Xbox, right? Here's an example, an example of him and his reaction to Sony having exclusive content for Destiny. I don't love the idea or the practice of us paying so other platforms can't play, kind of use a certain gun in a game or, or go do a certain level. Now I know I say that in Xbox history back with DLC windows with COD, like I understand the fingers are pointing right back at Xbox. So I can only be who I am. Like, so maybe it's not the best PR answer, but I don't like that. And when there's games that come along, um, Cuphead is a good example actually, where it comes along as a game, this one in the ID program, and the team had certain ambition about what they wanted to go do. And together with them, we, we, we wanted to invest more. We saw more opportunity. And what that turned into was us having an exclusive game on our platform because we continued to invest with them in the game. You know, that's a game that probably wouldn't have happened the way it did if we didn't invest the way we did. One of the reasons PC has, is still so strong and frankly strong now as it's probably ever been in, P in gaming is because it's an open platform and you put a game on PC and people can go, go play that game. And through things like crossplay, we're working to allow people to play games together regardless of where you bought the game. So we just put uh, Killer Instinct in Steam as an example, allowing people who bought the game on, on Windows or on Xbox or on Steam just to go play together. And I think if you're really about trying to drive just a specific device and you say, okay, I looked at the gaming, the gaming opportunity all up as a single device opportunity, maybe that's an approach. We don't see it that way. Kind of getting caught in a definition of gaming that's about me trying to do everything I can to get you to buy one specific device to play one specific variant of games. It's not really about growing the business. So, so this is about four years ago. And he's saying, you know, what they're trying to do is about growing the business. And that's why we don't do, we don't, we don't think that we should be, um, or, or companies should be um, getting exclusive content and shouldn't be focused on their console and their variants of game, like what does that even mean? I mean, it's all gibberish, gibberish right now. Because at the end of the day, you growing the business equals you not having anything for your console. 
when it launched. You not having barely anything while the Xbox One X was there. You didn't even utilize the power of the One X. It's all gibberish. I mean, the bullshit continues. This is where a lot of the stuff came from. A lot of the exclusives are bad. A lot of the ecosystem talk. This is, this is the interview where all of that came from. And it's all him telling gamers what to say and how to feel about gaming, even though gaming is so simple. Because the only thing that gamers should be caring about is games. And he's finding any excuse to tell you why he doesn't have them. Gaming is an ecosystem as opposed to a box. Oh, absolutely it is. As a games industry, how do we make games bigger? How do we do things to help developers build the best games that they can build using cloud, using local, whatever they want to use, and reach as many players as they can? Not just players, but also viewers. This year, more people are going to watch video games than play video games, and play time is up. So both these numbers are going up. That's all good for the games industry because it, it expands the footprint of number of people that care about uh, your franchise and your game. If that's true, then why get rid of Mixer? Hmm? If that's true, then why haven't your games really grown? I think the only one that kind of grew was Sea of Thieves, and that's not even as big as it should be as it's a game that's on, available on you know, PC and Xbox. Where, and, it, and it's available on Game Pass. And you only count players. And how does that make it bigger? How does that help you when you're, you're, you've been down and the only time you went up is during the pandemic and then you went directly back down to the point to where you're at negative double digits? There's just a lot of, like, just talk, just PR speak, just saying what he wants to say when he wants to say, when he needs to say it. He says he's really good at saying what he needs to say when he needs to say it. And it's just an excuse. It's barely PR. It's more, this is my excuse for not having this accepted. And then he'll try to deflect it on other platforms. That's why he said, um, you know, the other platform uh, trying to sell their singular platform and one style of game. Shut the fuck up. At the end of the day, gamers just want games. But that's the whole thing. Games for gamers has never been the main focus of Phil Spencer. I mean, even before he was the boss. He was talking about, uh, you know, going outside of the console and doing this and doing that. And people might see that as uh, uh, a pi pioneering the game. But in reality, PlayStation was already doing it the moment he was talking about it um, and having games on cell phones, on TVs and yada, yada, yada. They've done that already. You see, that's the thing with Phil Spencer. He continuously says the same thing decades apart or he would copy other people and act like he did it first. It's like a it's like a scramble of management. Like you can tell he's part of the bad management at Xbox. I mean, look at how he talks about Halo 4 and then how he talks about Halo Infinite and tell me if you can spot the similarities. Huge Halo fan. I uh, was around when we launched Halo 1 on the 360, which is one of the reasons I'm excited to see the anniversary edition and getting to play Halo 1 on live finally. Uh, get achievements for finishing the game will be a nice thing. Uh, Halo 4, there's some interesting things to think about with Halo. Halo 1 shipped 10 years ago. Um, for some gamers who came onto our platform in 360, their experience with Halo and Master Chief has been different than those of us that start on Xbox One, who had Halo 1, Halo 2, Halo like We really got centered on what Master Chief was about. Halo 4, back to Master Chief back to Master Chief at the core of an arc, a story arc, and really watching Master Chief be Master Chief, that kind of overpowering, cool character, the John Wayne, if you want to say, of, of the sci-fi world. And that's, that's really where you see 343 taking Halo is kind of back to its core. And even for us though, Halo, like us watching <gasps> this showcase, it brought back so many fun times because before Jenna moved to Los Angeles, she was living with me and we used to play split screen, multiplayer and co-op and everything together, mm -hmm. just sitting in our living room. So just watching this, I think for both of us, it brought back that nostalgia. So I know that's something that's very important to you guys as well. Yeah, you know, Bonnie Ross and the team at 343 wanted really to bring back that kind of classic Halo feel. And as I've watched, uh, the gameplay come together. There was just something about when Chief walks out the back of that Pelican um, that just, I felt at home every time I've seen it. Obviously I've played the, the game a number of times. So this is them trying to take Halo back into Halo multiple times. You're trying to take 
343's Halo 4 back into Bungie's Halo 1 and then try to take 343's Halo Infinite back into Halo 1 and that's how you described it that's how you tried to say it was going to do and it failed both times because you never believed in 343 and you only believed in Bungie and you wanted 343 to try to ride that wave of success that Bungie made for Halo and you failed at it every single time and it goes to show just the inconsistency of leadership that Phil Spencer has I mean look at Rare what many people don't know is Phil Spencer was the boss of Rare before he you know, became the boss of Microsoft. He was also the boss of Lionhead. And he, he steered both companies in the wrong way. Instead of having Rare continue to make games Rare was good at and wanted to make the creative development team that they were, he had them work on things for the Kinect and making avatars and doing shit that they didn't want to fucking do. Um, and so that whole team left. And then with Lionhead, he went off the success of Fable 2 and tried to make them make fucking Fable Connect, which fell into the fucking ground fully, face first, which unhinged the entirety of the Fable development team, which ended up, he ended up closing by surprise. This, this is a company that he used to run, right? He was the manager of. And when he became the boss of Xbox, he, by surprise, canceled that whole studio out and canceled the game that they were working on and now have Playground Games working on this game and they're in shambles. Phil Spencer has a whole plethora of ruined companies for Microsoft behind him. It's like he's there to shut shit down per, per se. You know, I mean, it just it, that's just what it's looking like it's happening right now. It's like everything he touched fails. I mean, picture it. He was on that with Microsoft. That shut down. Then he went to Microsoft Money. He was on that. That shut down. Then he went to Microsoft Works. He was on that. That shut down. Then he moved over to the Xbox where he was became a general manager and was in charge of Groove and fucking which shut down and Microsoft Movies and that shut down as well. Movies and TV. And then when he went over to the Xbox, he started this plethora of lies. Uh, remember when he started talking about single player games and how they were uh, endangered? And then he got backlash for it, so he changes his fucking mind all of a sudden. And if anything, uh, you can see more single-player games on the Xbox. And Microsoft is making uh, more single-player ga Xbox games on the history in Xbox history. It's the same shit over and over and over again. Remember what I told you about him and his management skills? About how he came in as a manager with Xbox? It's, he, was a, he was a manager of Rare, bro. Yeah, he's the guy who fucked Rare off. And you had developers talking about how he mismanaged Rare. Same thing with Scalebound, like, I mean, um, with, with Lionhead, Lionhead got canceled before he even, like, like, he was talking great about Lionhead a week before he canceled them, talking about he was satined by it, um, and, and they didn't even know, like, this literally, this right here is a tweet, five hours before he, they even got shut down, letting everybody know that they didn't even know they were going to get shut down, their management didn't even know that their, their fables were getting canceled and they were getting shut down, like, it was a surprise to them. And then Microsoft says it's one of their biggest uh, mismanagements they've ever had. Yeah, Phil Spencer is that guy who just isn't consistent enough. He lies and lies and lies about everything. Like, like remember Halo? Remember, remember the Halo movie? Huh? Remember how this, this is what he said a Halo movie should be. And we all know how this shit turned out. Does Microsoft still want to make a Halo movie? Do you see a future for the franchise in theaters or on, in long form? You know, others, others before me were probably more uh, interested in the movie than, than I am. I think Halo, um, Halo has a unique place in the gaming industry in that it has a, it's, I shouldn't say unique, there are other games with great stories, but it is one of the games that has a really deep, rich story there to be told. And I think doing it in a linear fashion, whether it's movie, television, uh, OTT content, it makes sense with this. But first and foremost, it's a game franchise. And if any, if we ever wanted, I, I can't afford, nor do I want to have any other uh, use of the Halo franchise mess with the core value proposition of, of what Halo is about. Uh, Bonnie and the team are, are, are excited about those opportunities. I want to make sure it's right for what we're trying to do with Halo in the long run. I think there is a right solution there, uh, but people ask me about when, they'll ask me about partnerships, and it's just too precious to us to ever kind of go and exploit 
in a way that would damage the franchise. So I hope it happens, uh, but if it does, it's got to happen in a way that's centered around what Halo's about. Good. And then he turns around and gives it to people who um, don't respect it the way he said it was going to be respected. Like, this is under his watch. This is, this is what he said to the public, and then this is what he delivered to the public. He delivered people who didn't even look at the game when recreating the show. But he just said you don't want to have somebody create something that disrespects it. So it's just mind-boggling how much bullshit the man gets away with. And then when he does tell the truth about things, nobody talks about it. Like everybody believing that Phil Spencer had nothing to do with the DRM and all of that good shit. This is what he had to say about him and the whole DRM and all that whole Xbox One launch situation. So I, I want to get to everything that's coming on the horizon. Halo 5, HoloLens, everything that's, that's you know, on, right. the, on the next. But I want to start someplace else. And that was a few years ago. Uh, Microsoft, when, when you first, your team first launched the Xbox One and unveiled yeah. it, you were skewered yeah. by some of your most loyal customers. They came after you for limiting the ability to play used games on the Xbox. They came after you for what was known as the always on feature, which was somewhat of a misnomer. It was only once a, once a day that the Xbox right. One was going to check in. You reversed course, and the team did. And I realize this is a bit like asking the Obama administration about the actions of George Bush. That said, you know, you, this was what you came in, this was the, the environment that you came into as you came in to head up Xbox. Have you recovered at this point from those early missteps, and, and what have you learned? Well, first, I want to clarify a couple things, because I don't think it's like uh, a president coming in with the past president. I was a member of the leadership team uh, that launched the Xbox One, and I've never tried to dodge the decisions that were made uh, and the sentiment around that decision. I was there, I was at the table, and I feel like I have no credibility in building a path forward if I don't first acknowledge that. You see, the media, the media didn't want to cover that. They wanted to make him the, 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 the darling to make this American gaming company uh, get a little, you know, helping hand up. And it just got blown out of proportion to where they celebritized. They celebritized this guy. You know, uh, he goes out and admits that he was a part of it, but they don't cover that. So people think that he saved Xbox by pushing it back. And no, Dimetric pushed back all those problems that the Xbox One had except the Connect when that shit first happened when the whole xbox one first happened but phil spencer is here admitting that he looked i was at the table i was, I was leadership too and i didn't say anything i didn't have a problem with it i thought it was okay so instead of the media putting that information out that he admitted to they instead acted like he was the savior when he was actually part of the problem and he's always been part of the problem and he always changes. He, like I said, he's changed and changed and changed. I mean, listen to his three pillars, right? Be, in, in the beginning, this, these are his three pillars before he was the boss of Xbox and someone else was the boss of Xbox. And then listen to the three pillars of, of the success of Xbox after. And you'll see the ma a major, major difference in why Xbox is failing right now today. You know, Microsoft, we have kind of three core pillars to our, our strategy right now. And I think this played out in our press conference. Uh, we're trying to show the biggest blockbuster games live on Xbox 360, opened the show with Call of Duty, had exclusive like Gears, which we believe will be the number one console exclusive this year, Forza, which I think shows a great racing game, introduced new franchises like Rise and the new Fable franchise and Fable Journey obviously closed with Halo, Halo 4 coming, uh, the next great uh, addition to the Halo franchise. So core blockbusters are real key for us, we'll continue to push there. Continuing to innovate with Connect. Connect feels like a new platform to us, we just launched that in November, and you see the, the capabilities of the platform continuing to evolve. Uh, we, it's a big focus for the organization. I'd say lastly, thinking about All Up Entertainment, and how we can redefine how people consume entertainment with voice search, Bing, bringing live TV to the Xbox, bring a broader set of media, movies, TV to the console. Surely that's the whole area that us as a first party studios were focused on. 
Yeah, when we look forward, say, over the next decade, and we say, what are you going to need to invest in to ensure that you're a leading game company? There are three components that are critically important as we see them. One, and first and foremost always, is the content. Gamers play games. People want to see great games. They want to play great games. They want to watch people play great games. We've invested at Microsoft in more first-party content, and the industry at large is creating more diverse and more interesting games than we ever have before. Content is critical. As you talked about before, gamers know how to reach us. Gamers are communal. They like to give feedback. They like to talk to each other. They like to play with each other on services like Xbox Live, to watch gameplay on services like Twitch and Mixer. Community is such an important part of what gaming is about and really differentiates it relative to other forms of entertainment in some pretty interesting ways. I'd say the third area that's becoming even more critical is we want to enable gamers to play games on any device is the cloud. We, earlier this fall, we showed a video for Project X Cloud. We announced our initiative to bring gaming, AAA gaming, to any device, and we're using the silicon work that we've done together to ensure that the thousands of games that have already been built for the Xbox platform are enabled on that platform with no work from the developer. And that's really bound down to the work that our teams have done together to ensure that those cloud blades that we're putting in our Azure data centers today run all of the great Xbox games that people love to play. See how fast it went from, uh, you know, blockbuster games being the main pillar to it being, oh, just content, you know, including TV and all that bullshit. Um, it's, it's a far cry from what it is. And it, it is shows. It shows exactly what it is. They have way less blockbusters than back then in their 360 days. And more focus on things that gamers really don't care about. Especially Xbox gamers. Game, Xbox gamers don't care about cloud. Let's be honest. It's available now on the Xbox and people don't use it on the Xbox. Because what the fuck for? You know, um, like the community, like they went and censored the community even worse and got rid of Mixer. What, 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 what do they what do they mean community? Like it's like they have three pillars um, and they're barely giving content. They got rid of Mixer, which is basically damaged the community. And then they censored the community, which makes it even worse for them. And then they talk about the cloud. And that's the main thing they've been pushing is services and cloud. And gamers don't really want that. And that's why Xbox is looking the way it is. It just seems like Phil Spencer ignored his problems. And he doesn't have too many problems. People forget how many problems the 360 had and it was still the most successful Xbox. Um, they forget about the HD DVD, the Red Rings of Death, the the Wi-Fi. Um, not, you know, you had to buy another piece for a Wi-Fi and the prices of the, of, of the, of the memory card and all of that good shit that they had proprietary back then as well. Let's see how Peter Moore handled um, one of the most underrated problems of the Xbox, and that's with the PS3 coming out with the Blu-ray and Xbox having to go with HD DVD. But since they didn't have HD DVD built in, you had to buy an extra piece. And there was a controversy of people thinking that they were going to make games for the HD DVD as well. And people wasn't going to like that because not everybody had the HD DVD. This is just one of the problems and watch how he handles it and watch what he says about the importance of games over shit like this. Is it is a given is this thing's going to take a little while to sort itself out and um, I'm not sure it happens fast enough for what Sony needs it to happen to for Blu-ray. But about, I, you know what, one of the things, get, we're about the games and as I said earlier, the HD DVD player is, is if you are fortunate enough that you, that, that you can a, a, afford a nice uh, TV or a projector screen and you want to look at high-def movies, then, then there's an option for you to buy, but if you don't, that's fine also. Talking about the HD DVD player, can you commit absolutely that you will never... Probably not! <laughs> ...that you will never release games on the HD DVD? Uh, we have no plans to release games on HD DVD. This thing, this thing just takes lives of its own. I, I, and, and we've said specifically, and you've read it, that we're not going to do it. So I'll say again, we're not going to do it. I think people fail to realize just how much harder it was for Peter Moore and Don Matrick um, to sell as many Xbox 360s as they did. Phil Spencer has it way, way easier. Um, people forget that the Xbox launched, the Xbox 360 launched before PlayStation, right? And that would make you think, hmm, 
Well, they had a head start. Well, they did. But then when Sony came out, they were way ahead in technology. Everything from a Blu-ray in it to having Wi-Fi built in. I mean, you had to buy all these extra parts for the Xbox um, just to make it work the way you wanted to. I mean, you can plug in the Ethernet, but you needed to buy an extra part to make it Wi-Fi ready, whereas Sony already had that. Um, same thing with, with, the, uh, with, the, with the Blu-ray. You had to buy an extra HD DVD, which turned out to be the weaker source um, of, of movie consumption. Um, Microsoft was forced to make that because Sony was launching with a Blu-ray already built in. And then they had the Red Rings of Death, one of the most catastrophic um, um, fails in gaming history. It was the most catastrophic fail in gaming history to the point that where they had a f over a 50 over 50 percent failure rate um and they had to endure that as well um not to mention the Wii um being a massive success and beating the both the shit out of both of them um phil spencer all he had to deal with was a bad comment and bad business practices that they fixed before the console even launched and he still couldn't get it right. Took away the took away the connect. Still couldn't get it right. Um, launched this gen with no games. Like obviously, that's not going to be getting it right because you need to launch with games. You need blockbuster games to make your console sell, rather they like it or not. And I understand that people saying, "Oh, it's been sold and it's been selling," and yeah, it's all good and it's been selling and it's sold and all that. But who suffered through the selling? Xbox gamers and you guys forgot that Xbox gamers and games are, are the important factor these two bosses didn't fall into that realm of not caring about the gamer and Phil Spencer is the guy who pretends that he cares but does absolutely nothing for them as far as bringing them the games that they want from Microsoft that utilizes this hardware that they spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on just period just people what Don Matrix said about exclusive blockbuster games all right and here he is uh Don Matrix great to see you again Don great to see you Jeff thanks, for, the having, thanks for having me on the show really absolutely well it's uh, great to have your press conference yesterday you guys did a, a great job and uh, great to have you here today and I gotta say a lot of people are talking about this smart glass technology that you guys unveiled. I understand you're demoing it at the show. Do you think, is, is this a game changer for you guys? Yeah, we think it's really uh, an important platform level innovation for us. It's, it's uh, adding the capabilities of sharing uh, content uh, with devices that you already own and right. making your Xbox and your big screen TV the center of just amazing experiences. Yeah, it's very cool. Now let's talk, uh, you know, something that our audience cares about, our games. And uh, you guys you know, have a lot of entertainment announcements, a lot of other yeah. great stuff. How important are, you know, the first party games and those big blockbusters oh, to you going forward? They're, they're um, incredibly important. And uh, our team that's creating Halo 4 uh, this year, I think, is going to have the biggest blockbuster, biggest exclusive on any platform right. uh, this holiday. Um, I know you had a chance to come up and visit. I've been, I, 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 I've been yeah. playing uh, the game, and it's awesome. And Shit. we're really excited about the innovation that the teams uh, come up with. You see what he did there? Did, you, did anybody else notice Don Matrick sounding just like Phil Spencer, even though this was before Phil Spencer? So this is literally Phil Spencer sounding like Don Matrick. We want you to be the center of the gaming. We want you to, you know, to play on the, on, on the devices that you already own. And yada, yada. Same exact language. As diametric, except one thing, talking about the importance of blockbuster games on Xbox. So literally, you got a downgraded version of Don Matrick in Phil Spencer. And he's pushing things like fucking Game Pass. I mean, he said that it Game Pass leads to more game sales and goes, it's very healthy for our games such as State of Decay 2 and Forza Horizon 4. It is very healthy, right? But then the truth comes out that Game Pass is actually leading to cannibalization of their quality games from a Microsoft internal document. It's like you can't make this shit up. He's literally destroying Xbox from the ground up. This is some big news that's coming out right now. It looks like um, 
Microsoft is going to be buying Activision Blizzard. Activision Blizzard shares have been halted with this news pending that's coming out on this. Right now, you can see Microsoft shares at 30159. That's down 2.78%. Activision Blizzard jumping all the way to where that deal is anticipated to happen at $90 a share. This is a stock that closed at $65.39 on Friday. A company at that point with a market cap of just over $50 billion, almost $51 billion. Uh, this is a big deal, very big deal. You can see Activision Blizzard shares up by 37%, all the way up to $90, as I mentioned. Microsoft shares uh, coming under a little more pressure, although we've seen those shares under pressure because of the higher yields that you've seen in the, in the Treasury complex this morning. 301.55, still looking for the details of this. Uh, but again, it looks like this is news that's just coming out. And just reading you through some of the headlines on this, Bobby Kotick is going to continue to serve as the CEO of Activision Blizzard. Reading through some more news as this is hitting the wires right now. Microsoft's going to be acquiring Activision Blizzard uh, for $95 a share, this says, in an all-cash transaction that's valued at $68.7 billion. So that's a big premium, guys. That's a premium of about 45%. Um, watching what happens with this, and obviously there's been a lot of news, gentlemen, uh, coming out about Look, Activision Blizzard. Those shares have been down pretty sharply as this news has come out over the last several months. Right. Andrew? Uh, this, I was going to say, the stock down about 20, had been down about 27%, 27%. in large yeah. part because of the controversy uh, that we'd seen in the, in the Wall Street Journal and reports about uh, workplace culture. I would argue to you, Microsoft buying this company at this price uh, is a bit of a rebuff, if you will, uh, about some of those reports, or at least an acceptance uh, that the culture uh, is acceptable to them. Of course, they've had their own challenges uh, just last week, saying, saying that they were going to be looking into their own workplace culture. But this does appear to be a big win uh, for, for Bobby Kotick. Of course, the big question that I, I'm looking at right now is just whether regulators will ultimately approve a transaction like this, you know, under the sort of traditional antitrust theory uh, mm -hmm. between Microsoft and, and Activision. It's still a very small market share. This is a very fractured marketplace. But you've seen the Biden administration uh, take a much more aggressive approach to antitrust and a much more sort of all-encompassing approach. Meanwhile, Microsoft has remained largely outside of the sort of target of Washington, in large part because it dealt with that, well, if is you this will, a, a metaverse, uh, more than two uh, decades ago. Is, number one, is it a, a metaverse play? I don't know. Yeah. We're all going to be playing Huge around. Huge metaverse play. I think, and that's, Sachin I Adela think, from a strategic kind of hinted at this. Yeah, Sachin, Sachin, Sachin Nadella has, has hinted at this. And yep. By the way, guys, we should mention that we do have interviews coming up with both Bobby Kotick and Phil Spencer, who is the head of Microsoft Gaming. Both those interviews coming up at 9.30 this morning. Yeah. So an hour from now, we'll be sitting down talking to both of them. That's as we all know, Microsoft made a play to buy Activision after buying Bethesda. And the sharp ear, the, the people who are actually paying attention to the whole FTC thing would have noticed what they said in the very beginning of this about the stocks of Activision and how low they were. And after the announcement of this, they shot up uh, to $90 a share. I mean, it was down to 70 almost $60 a share. Right now, it's down to a 70 once again because of all the stuff and how the stuff is playing out um, with the Activision deal. And the reason why it's happening that way, the reason why it's fucked up now is because of Phil Spencer and because of his big mouth and because of the lies that he says, even on businessmen talking about him and Sony had uh, great conversations to the point to where Jim Ryan had to come out and said that is actually contrary to the fact. And now we have all of this happening and the FTC is coming to block it and CMA has problems and the UK or EU or whatever the fuck has problems and it's turning into a shit show. Rather or not the deal goes through, doesn't matter. What it does matter is the mistakes made by Phil Spencer during this time lying about shit. You see, they were going to sit. They, they sat down with Bobby Kotick and Phil Spencer when this deal got put out. But you rarely see anyone sitting down with Phil Spencer anymore. You see Satya Nadella and Bobby Kotick talking and they are getting more and more desperate. But Phil Spencer has been cut out of talking with the media like that about this. He's talking to like fucking YouTubers because he is stupid 
<laughs> just as simple as that. He's out of his he's, he's out of his league and he's been pushed too far as far as a celebrity goes that people want to see him as the face of the Xbox. But in reality, he doesn't know shit about the stuff that he's doing. If he did, he would never have went to Sony with a proposal for a company that they did not own yet. He thought they already owned them. He put out tweets saying, welcome to the family, and they aren't even bought yet. That's how little he knows, and nobody points this stuff out. That's why I don't say nothing. But the man is one of the biggest idiots in gaming. And he has hurt this deal, whether it goes through or not. Phil Spencer may be seeing his job go away or Microsoft is just that motherfucking stupid to keep somebody like that on who has now maybe messed up the biggest gaming deal in history because he wanted to talk shit to Jim Ryan. It just, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. But hey, the FTC thing is a whole nother chapter of the Xbox documentary. So, I guess I'll see y'all then. <laughs>